Hey, it's Gary again. I'm back. You're back. We're all back here for what is now the penultimate, penultimate episode of Gundog. That's right. Episode eight of nine. This one's called Heart Shaped Box, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I think you're going to really enjoy this one. First of all, though, just a couple of pieces of Gundog related news, which I suspect if you stuck with the YouTube series uh, so far, if you're here through uh, the eighth episode, uh, then you might find this interesting. After a very long wait, too long, but we finally got there, we did actually, uh, just this past week, uh, launch the podcast version of Gundog, which as fun as the Twitch version and this YouTube archive uh, have been, I think the podcast is gonna be like the main um, outlet, the main medium through which people are going to discover Gundog. And so far, that seems to be the case. We'll get to that in just a moment. But basically what happened was the reason why it took us so long to get the podcast launched was um, uh, Realm Media, which is one of the biggest names in uh, narrative fiction uh, podcasts, got involved and said, hey, you know, let's um, distribute this together and we can get a much bigger audience. And uh, it just took a little while to do all the legal stuff and then all the technical migration, getting all the podcast material migrated over to their uh, side and ready to go. And we finally were able to deploy it uh, this week. And we uh, we actually launched just yesterday. And guess what? It's already been, as far as I can tell, something of a success. Take a look at this. Uh, these are the Apple Podcasts uh, science fiction charts for... Uh, the United States of America, just one territory, but certainly one of the biggest ones. And there we see Gundog in number three, my goodness. And the two podcasts, if you know anything about podcasts, the two above it are are two of the longest established and, and biggest, most well-known um, uh, narrative podcasts out there. Old Gods of Appalachia and Welcome to Night Vale are huge. They've been around for a long time and they've amassed very, very large audiences. So to come in behind only those two in the Apple podcasts uh, sci-fi chart in uh, the USA is is pretty amazing and overall in uh, over in the overall fiction chart on Apple podcasts we are at number 16 which is pretty amazing for a brand new podcast my first time doing one of these things to come in uh, at number 16 in fiction overall at number three in sci-fi is actually really really cool and I'm very very excited about that and what I would say is let's go back over here um if you've enjoyed Gundog, if you are interested in uh, supporting the show or helping other people discover it, um, this is what the people at Realm have told me to relay to you. Please do go ahead, go over to uh, Apple Podcasts. That's the biggest kind of podcasting destination, I think, uh, in the market. Spotify and, and others are, are big as well, but Apple Apple's the biggest one. And it's also the only uh, podcast destination that allows you to leave both ratings and reviews and positive ratings and positive reviews are one of the ways in which um, a podcast kind of moves up through the charts and becomes more visible and helps other people discover it. So if you've enjoyed Gundog, if you just want to support the show, um, please, please, please do go over to um, Apple Podcasts, leave a rating uh, and a review and help other people discover this story that we've all been enjoying together. I believe Spotify also lets you leave ratings, not necessarily reviews, but you can leave a rating. If you're listening um, via Spotify, or if that's your podcast destination of choice, please go over there uh, and leave a rating as well. Apple Podcasts, though, um, is the big one. So ratings and reviews really, really help. Um, and as this um, as this uh, YouTube and Twitch experiment kind of wraps up, just one more episode to go I, I, after this, the podcast experiment is just beginning, right? As this version of, of the Gundog um, episodic story um, comes to a close. It's starting all over again in, in podcast form and being discovered by a whole new audience, which is very exciting. And um, uh, one of the ways in which I am hopefully going to be celebrating that is with some Gundog merchandise. This is really, really cool. Um, so I had this cool logo made. I always imagine like, what would it look like to, if you're actually like a Gundog pilot or a gunner, what kind of like squadron patch would you have on um, your arm? And my friend Chandana Ekanayaka, who did the um, Gundog logo that you see immediately be, uh, uh, above you, uh, or above me, I should say, also created this. And I thought this was really cool. This is kind of the Gundog um, M151 Armored Combat Biped uh, official uh, squadron patch, which I think is really, really super cool. And I'm excited for 
um, people to be able to kind of own some version of this. So I'm having stickers made. Stickers are nice and easy. But as you can see, it's all it's very much done in the style of a embroidered patch that you would actually kind of attach to, you know, a pilot's um, uniform or a baseball hat or whatever. And I'm having some of those made as well. And so very, very shortly, I'll have an announcement for you all about um, some kind of online store, a storefront merchandise destination where you can go and get um, the, uh, the stickers, the patches, maybe there'll be other things as well. And there will certainly be one other thing, which I'm actually really excited about. This is probably the, the silliest thing that I've done, but I, I, I think it's going to be really, really fun. I wanted to actually have like a model figurine of the hero mech from Gundog, the Liberator, the M151. I wanted to have something like that made. And I have a bunch of friends um, who are really into wargaming miniatures, Warhammer, all that kind of stuff. They love to assemble and paint their own figures. And I, I really like the idea of doing something in that vein. So let's just get rid of the uh, the patch here. Uh, how do I get rid of that? Uh, okay. Check this out. This is the Liberator. We had these. We had these made, uh, specially custom made, and it's this one's fully assembled. These are going to come as like a little model kit, and you'll kind of crazy glue the the pieces together. If I can do it, you can do it. I did this. I did put this one together in about 10, 15 minutes, and this is actually like a full three D model of what the Hero Mech, the Liberator uh, from Gundog, uh, looks like. And we put it on this cool base with this kind of cool. Um, in this cool action pose and once it's assembled you could either leave it in this kind of like straightforward kind of you know gunmetal gray color or you could paint it yourself this material is paintable and uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun with that I'm really really excited about getting these out to you I have 500 I may have over ordered I have 500 of these things currently sitting in my spare room over there waiting for me to ship out to people and so as soon as I've got the stickers and the patches and there's some kind of storefront um, online, I'll be uh, putting all of that together for you to go. And if you want to get a sticker or a patch or a t-shirt, maybe, I don't know, or, or certainly one of the model kits, uh, those will all be up um, and running uh, very, very soon. So super excited about that. Um, podcast is up. We're super excited. There's merchandise coming, but I know why you're actually here. And that, of course, is for episode eight. Uh, you may remember that uh, last time on Gundog, last time on Gundog, uh, it was a kind of a literal cliffhanger. Dakota and Runyon had um, stealthily infiltrated the mech fortress. They had stolen some data, but on the way out, they had been kind of um, discovered and ambushed by the mech. And then they had to fight their way back to the Liberator. They were being um, attacked by swarms of drones and getting very heavily damaged. The Liberator and Rosie were in really bad shape. And in fact, the only way that they could escape, if you recall, was basically by um, plummeting over a cliff into... Uh, the river below. And that is where we left uh, the story last week. Let's continue now with episode eight. Uh, as I said, this one's called Heart Shaped Box. Enjoy. Gundog by Gary Witta. Chapter 26 Dakota woke with a start. She felt dazed, disoriented. Unable at first to figure out even which way was up. It was too dark to see, and her head was throbbing like hell. She could feel that she was lying on her back, and that Runyon was there next to her. She called his name, but he neither moved nor spoke in response. She put her hand on his chest and felt it gently rise and fall alive, but still out cold. Even as her eyes adjusted to the dark, there was nothing to see but the localized glow of various warning lights blinking on Runyon's cockpit dash, and more of them at Dakota's station above it. She realized that, like her, the entire Liberator must be lying prone, resting on its back, so that everywhere inside the cockpit was ninety degrees askew. What was once forward was now up. She touched her hand to her head, and it stung. She could feel the wetness of blood, 
She must have struck her head on something during the fall. Only now did she remember where they were, where they had to be. At first, she had thought it was the black of night outside the cockpit glass. But no, they were underwater. It all came rushing back to her, the desperate flight from the mech, the plunge off the cliff. They were lying on the bottom of the river. As Dakota focused on the darkness beyond the cockpit glass, a small school of fish appeared from the gloom before disappearing into the murk again. She looked around the cockpit for any sign of water coming in. But despite the pounding they'd taken from the mech swarm, there was no indication of a breach. They were safe. But for how long? Were they breathing what little oxygen remained in the cabin? Or did the Liberator have its own supply? If it did, was it even working? The gun dogs seemed to be powerless, save for those few blinking lights. But there was only one of the Liberator systems that she really worried about right now. Mom? There was no response. Dakota's stomach rolled with a wave of anxiety. What if Rosie was damaged beyond repair? It would be too cruel a fate to be reunited with her mother after a lifetime apart, only to lose her again so soon. Stolen from her by the mech for a second time. The thought filled her with dread, but she refused to submit to it. Not yet. She found that her injured arm had regained most of its mobility, though it still burned when she fully rotated it. Careful not to disturb Runyon, she managed to position herself so that she had access to his console. She tried a few things. Nothing worked. Everything was dead to the touch. But finally, she was able to restore some lighting to the cockpit. A dim red glow that only highlighted the direness of their situation. Turning her attention back to Runyon now she had light to see by, she saw that the jagged piece of shrapnel was still lodged in his shoulder, and the dark, wet patch around it had only grown larger. Carefully, she climbed over him to reach the emergency medical kit secured to the wall above his head. Wrenching it free, she flipped open the lid. But as she rummaged through its contents, she found her hands were shaking so badly she could barely use them. She closed her eyes and balled her hands into fists, then took a deep breath, trying to center herself. It took a moment, but she got her nerves under control. With steadier hands, she found gauze, alcohol swabs, and tape. It would have to do. There was also a kind of painkiller shot that Dakota might have used on herself to relieve the pain in her arm and head, but she decided to save it for Runyon. His need would be far greater. She unzipped his suit and peeled it back, revealing the tank top and bare flesh beneath, darker around the area of the wound, where bruising had begun to form. She read the instructions on the painkiller device and administered it, holding the tip against his skin and pressing the plunger. She waited for a minute for it to take effect, because she hated the thought of hurting him as much as the next part surely would. She reached for the jagged piece of metal protruding from Runyon's shoulder. Then, on second thought, found a roll of bandage from the medical kit and wrapped it around her hands so she could grip the metal firmly without cutting herself. Her mind traveled back to the many times that Sam had treated small injuries of her own with scavenged sticking plasters. She hated it when it was time to remove them, but Sam would always distract her, then tear it off so quickly she barely noticed. It was when you made a meal of it, peeling it off slowly, that it hurt. Runyon wouldn't need distracting. That he was unconscious was a mercy in this circumstance. But if she tried to remove it slowly, he might wake and panic and struggle midway through. Sam's way was better. She straddled Runyon for better leverage, then wrapped her bandaged hands around the metal shard. She took two calming breaths, and then yanked it from his shoulder with one clean jerk. Runyon jolted awake, eyes wide, and let out a piercing cry. He would have jerked upright if not for the safety harness keeping him strapped to his chair. It's all right, said Dakota quickly. Runyon, you're all right. Look at me. Everything's okay. We're alive. Runyon's panicked eyes darted around before they found Dakota's, 
and he seemed to calm some, though he was breathing fast and shallow. Dakota pressed a gauze pad soaked with alcohol over his wound. Runyon stiffened, hissed with pain through gritted teeth. Dakota taped the gauze down and then used the wrappings from her hands to bind it. What happened? Runyon asked. Where are we? Bottom of the river, said Dakota. Remember? We went over the edge to get away from the mech. They didn't follow us. We're safe. He looked up, above her eye line. You're bleeding. I know, said Dakota. It's nothing. It looks bad. Let me fix it. Now it was his turn to tend to her. Dakota unbuckled his harness and he sat up, taking a moment to get used to the unfamiliar orientation of the cockpit. Then he sorted through the medical kit, finding more of the gauze and swabs. Hold still, he said. Dakota did so, biting her lip to distract herself from the pain as he cleaned the gash on her head and dressed it. There, he said, leaning back to admire his handiwork. Well, at least we won't bleed to death down here. Dakota smiled, then noticed that Runyon was looking at her strangely, gazing at her as though hypnotized. Runyon, what is it? You're beautiful, he said, seemingly without thinking. He'd just let it slip. Dakota felt her face flush. That's the painkiller talking. You're right, he said, looking away. I'm sorry. Even in the dim light, it was clear from the look on his face, not only that he had meant it, but that he regretted saying it. Dakota wanted to tell him it was okay, both to have said it, and, she realized in that moment, maybe even to have meant it. But Runyon had already moved past the moment. His attention now turned to the clusters of indicator lights blinking on the console above him. What kind of shape are we in? He asked. Rosie? Do we have power? I can't raise her, Dakota said. Just before we got here, her voice was breaking up and now, nothing. She's just broken she told herself. Not dead. Broken can be fixed. Runyon tried flipping switches on his console. Normally, there would be some kind of affirmative response, but the cockpit remained silent. Still. Eventually, he was able to bring one of the smaller instrument panels to life. He studied the trickle of data it displayed with a frown. Well, it's not great, but believe it or not, it could be worse, he said. Almost everything is offline. But the main reactor still has a heartbeat, so. We should be able to get moving if we can just figure a few things out. We don't need Rosie for that. You and I can- He stopped himself. When he saw the look on Dakota's face. Oh, Dak. I'm- I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. I- I'm sure she's okay. We'll get her back. We'll- He trailed off. Don't make promises unless you know you can keep them, Dakota said. She turned away and climbed back into the gunnery chair above. They were going to get this machine up and running, and they were going to find out how much of her mother was left inside. Runyon knew far more about the complex inner workings of the Liberator than Dakota did. His uncanny knack for memorization had enabled him to pick up more during their short training than Dakota thought she'd ever know. And under his direction... They spent the next hour repairing and restarting various systems and subsystems until they were at least partially back in business. So far, the most tangible achievement was turning the main cabin lights back on, casting enough light to attract curious fish from out of the darkness beyond. But now came the real test, the one that would decide their fate. It was time to see if the Liberator could still move. Here goes nothing, said Runyon. He flipped a succession of switches on his console, and they both waited. For a moment, there was nothing. And then their seats started rumbling beneath them. Runyon whooped. Main engine start, he cried. Strap in. I'm going to try to get us upright. Dakota strapped herself back into her seat and watched her console as behind her, Runyon worked the control yoke. At first, nothing happened but then she felt her seat press hard against her back, lifting her up. 
and suddenly her whole world pivoted around her. The Liberator was rising. All right, said Runyon. Feeling the power of the gundog at his fingertips once again seemed to be restoring some of his own energy too. I got her sitting up. Now let's see if she can stand. A thought occurred to Dakota. Wait. If we stand upright, do we risk being seen? She asked. She didn't know how deep this river was, and the mech might still be up there, waiting for them to resurface. Runyon checked a gauge on his holographic display. The water here's deeper than we are tall, he said. We should be okay. He worked the controls again, and the cockpit lurched around them as the Liberator tried to find its feet beneath it. And then they were rising, light becoming visible from above, the sun's rays breaking through the surface of the water. It was morning up there. When the Liberator had risen to its full height, they were still below the surface as Runyon had promised, but not by much. Maybe only ten feet of clearance. I don't like this, said Dakota. We might be visible. Nothing on my scope, said Runyon. Yours? Dakota checked her scanner, which usually lit up targets for her to shoot at. It was operational, but showing nothing. Clear, she said. The mech must think we're dead, said Runyon. Still, I think we should stay submerged until dark just to be safe, but it's your call. Dakota was about to ask Runyon why the decision should fall on her, but then she realized, in Rosie's absence, he viewed Dakota as being in command. Technically, neither of them carried a rank, but Dakota was Rosie's daughter, and the Liberator had been left for her to find. It was a nod of respect, she knew, but the sudden responsibility weighed heavy on her. Until now, it had been her job only to follow Rosie's orders. She wasn't nearly ready to start giving them. Let's follow the river for as long as it's still deep enough to keep us covered, she said, finally. When it's dark, we'll surface and see what's what. What she meant was, we'll see what's happened to Rosie. During their initial repairs, Runyon had explained to Dakota that he couldn't check how badly damaged Rosie was from the cockpit. To do that, he'd have to manually inspect her memory module in the Liberator's system core, which was only accessible from the outside. And they couldn't do that until they were out of the water. Runyon worked the controls, and the Liberator took a first step forward but it faltered almost immediately, its right leg buckling, throwing Dakota forward, flailing in her harness. The entire cockpit was now canted at an angle. An alarm sounded, and Runyon shut it off. Damn it, he said. Looks like our right leg's broken. Hydraulic pressure failure. We took some real damage in that fall. Can we walk? Dakota asked. We have to try. Can't just sit here, said Runyon. Hold on. Runyon applied his feet to the pedals again and tried to take another step. From somewhere down below came the awful sound of grinding metal. But the left leg moved, and the Liberator didn't topple over. Runyon took another step, this one with the broken right leg, and though it was unsteady, it held. As they took another step, and another, Dakota watched the holographic gauges on her display. The hydraulic pressure in the right leg was fluctuating wildly. The warnings were flashing everywhere. We're limping along, said Runyon. But I don't know how much more damage we're doing to the right leg. Forcing it to walk in this condition, if it gives way altogether, it won't, said Dakota. The alternative was unthinkable. The Liberator hobbled along the winding riverbed at a fraction of its normal walking pace, dragging its right foot the way ahead through the murk illuminated by its headlights. Since there was nothing to shoot at down here, there was little for Dakota to do but look on and wonder at the underwater world they were traversing, an entire universe she'd never even dreamed of. She watched schools of fish part before them, shimmering past the cockpit dome in flashes of silvery light. But she was exhausted, so even with the lurching motion of the cockpit, it wasn't long before she succumbed to sleep in her gunnery chair. She woke what felt like only a moment later, roused by a tapping at her back. It was Runyon, 
nudging her chair with the toe of his boot. Dak, wake up. She rubbed her eyes, looked at the cockpit display, and saw that she'd been asleep for hours. Looking up, she could see shafts of sunlight penetrating the water above. It was still daytime. What did I miss? She asked. Well, we're still standing, said Runyon. And we're a long way from Bismarck, 10 miles by the nav. Anything on your scope? She checked her readouts. Nothing, but I still don't know if the scanners are working properly with all the system's damage. There could be mech above us right now. They might have been tracking us this whole time. What should we do? Asked Runyon. Again, he was deferring to Dakota's authority, and her stomach churned at the prospect of making the wrong call. Not only could it mean the death of both of them, it could mean the end of everything Rosie had sacrificed and planned for for decades. The end of hope. How Dakota wished her mother were still here to guide them. We can't stay down here forever, she said. Sooner or later, we have to take a chance. We'll go up as soon as it's dark. Though it was the only course of action that made sense, she hated the thought of surfacing. In just a short time, she had become accustomed to the strange sense of safety they enjoyed down here, beneath a shield of water that the mech were unable to penetrate. Okay, keep your eye on the scope, said Runyon with a yawn. My turn to get some sleep. When darkness came, Runyon turned the liberator toward the river's edge. Pilot and gunner both braced themselves as they traipsed up the sloping bank. The gun dog's massive feet sinking deep into the silt and mud. Twice it stumbled and almost fell, the hydraulic pressure in the right leg dropping dangerously low. But Runyon had by now learned to compensate for the liberator's unequal balance. As each careful step brought them closer to the surface, Dakota slid both arms into the gun control armatures, ready to blast whatever might be up there. But she knew that if the mech had followed them and were lying in wait for them now, the Liberator wouldn't be able to put up much of a fight. Most of its weapons were offline, and those that still functioned were either empty or low on ammunition. Dakota braced herself for enemy contact nonetheless, prepared to stand and fight to the very last, as her mother had done decades ago. Runyon had killed the Liberator's headlights, and as the cockpit broke the surface of the water, Dakota was bathed in moonlight from a crescent in the sky above. There was little else to see, just the black silhouette of a forest up ahead. The cockpit continued to rise as the Liberator made its way up the riverbank, but it wasn't until it stood entirely out of the water, covered in muck and mire, that Dakota exhaled. She'd kept one eye on her target scope the entire time, dialed out to maximum range, and had seen nothing provided the scanners were still in fact working. They were alone. No sign of any mech, she said. Maybe you're right, and they think we're still back there, dead. Let's find some cover and do an external systems check. Runyon started them toward the trees, and the Liberator limped into their midst. Once they were deep inside the wooded area, he stopped and brought the gun dog into a crouch, its head dropping just beneath the uppermost boughs. It was the best cover they were going to get. Dakota stayed in the cockpit to keep a watchful eye on the long-range scanner, while Runyon headed outside to assess the damage. She wanted so desperately to sleep some more. The fatigue from her very own Battle of Bismarck weighing heavily on her. But her anxiety wouldn't allow it. So she just sat there, impatiently eyeing her console, until Runyon returned. You want the good news or the bad news, he asked. Uh, it's been a while since I heard something good, said Dakota. Good news is, we got exactly what we needed out of that mech data center. Everything we downloaded sitting in the main system drive, totally intact. And the bad? We're in pretty rough shape. That swarm really knocked the crap out of us. Two big breaches in our armor plate, the right mobilizers almost totally shot. The internals aren't much better. Some of the system boards are smashed or fried, and even some of the ones that look undamaged aren't responding. He held up a hand to preempt the question on Dakota's lips. Rosie's memory core seems intact. No physical damage that I can see. 
The subsystems that power it are all burned out. Overloaded. I tried rerouting to a different PSU, but it's not compatible. I can't get it to reboot. It, it won't take a charge. It's just totally dead. Runyon winced, clearly regretting his choice of words. Dakota tried to focus on other concerns. Mobility and survivability had to come first. That meant prioritizing the Liberator's busted leg, then the weapon systems, then Rosie. The Liberator can repair itself, right? She asked. The particle reprocessor's fine, said Runyon. But we need raw material to feed the Reclaimer. And to repair this much damage? Well, we're gonna need a whole shitload of it. So let's go find some, Dakota said. Runyon started to climb back into his seat, but Dakota stopped him. No, we're not moving the Liberator again until we know where we're taking it. That leg's already in bad shape, and if it gives out, we're finished. She unbuckled her harness. She hated what she was about to say, but knew she had no choice. We're going out on foot. They walked together through the forest for an hour without speaking. Not because they had nothing to say, but simply because they were both exhausted after all they had been through and needed all their focus to stay alert. Their suits kept them hidden from mech sensors, but they couldn't rule out a chance visual encounter. With each step, Dakota grew more nervous. Every meter of distance they put between themselves and the Liberator was another meter away from the safety of the armored cockpit she'd already grown so accustomed to. More importantly, it was another meter the Liberator would have to risk traveling on a broken leg. If they found the raw materials the gun dog needed to repair itself, but it was already too broken to reach them, then what? Would they carry hunks of scrap metal to the Liberator by hand, one piece at a time? Yes, thought Dakota, if that's what it takes. Eventually, the forest gave way to exactly what they were looking for, a road. Their plan was to seek out the hulks of old vehicles, a rich source of raw material commonly found along abandoned roadways like this one. On several occasions while on the run with Sam, and at least once on her journey from the township to the Four Faces, Dakota had walked along a highway that was jammed end to end with rusted vehicles that snaked all the way to the horizon. But as their damned luck would have it, this road offered them only cracked and overgrown asphalt. Not a single vehicle in sight. Hardly the salvation they were hoping for. Still, they followed it. One road would lead to another, and eventually they would find what they needed. They walked in single file along a shallow ditch that ran parallel to the road, affording them some small cover. They were, after all, moving by day. It was a risk, but one they needed to take. Without light to see by, they might pass what they needed without noticing it. Runyon led the way. As Dakota kept pace behind him, she found herself reflecting on how much her picture of him had changed since the township, which felt like a lifetime ago. She'd always known he was kind, if meek. Now she knew he was smarter, more resourceful, and more courageous than she had ever given him credit for. He had done so much for her and all the while asking for nothing in return. Runyon, she said, keeping her voice low. He glanced back at her. What? Thank you, she said. For what? I don't know. Everything, I guess. For never giving up. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry. You don't have anything to be sorry for, he said. Yes, I do. I never had time for you when we were in the township together. I was just trying to keep my head down, stay out of trouble. I should have been kinder to you. It's just, it's not easy for me to trust people. It never has been. Well, as long as we trust each other now, that's what matters, right? Said Runyon. With my life, said Dakota. Something about that statement made Runyon stop and turn around to face her. The same he said, and suddenly he seemed self-conscious, diffident again. He shifted his weight from one foot to the other. 
He didn't look away from her as he had on past occasions. But still, he seemed somehow paralyzed, as if wanting to act on some deep impulse but unable to. Brave as he was, in moments like this, he was still the same Runyon she'd known in the township. She could feel him floundering and decided, not entirely for his sake, to come to his rescue. She reached out and took his hand, held it tight. She felt his heartbeat quicken. For that one moment, there was no mech, no liberator, no townships, no war, nothing but the two of them. She leaned closer. It's getting dark, said Runyon, suddenly nervous again. We should hole up soon, get some rest. He let his hand slip from hers, turned away, and walked on. Night came quickly, and there was no moon. It was soon so dark that Dakota found there was little difference between having her eyes open and closed. She and Runyon unfurled the bedrolls that they'd carried on their backs and laid them down in a section of ditch that was mostly covered by scrub, the best camouflage this area could offer. Runyon waited for Dakota to lie down first, then positioned himself next to her in the opposite direction, so her feet were at his head and vice versa. Out of courtesy or trepidation, Dakota couldn't tell. She tossed and turned for a while, shivering in the frigid cold. Even in the dark, she could see her breath fogging before her. Finally, she made a decision. She reoriented herself so that she was facing the same way as Runyon. What are you doing, he said. I'm cold, she replied. Runyon said nothing in response. And for a moment, Dakota feared she'd made a mistake. And then she felt his arms snaking around her. She responded in kind, and the two of them lay entwined with one another, feeling the warmth of each other's bodies until they fell asleep. When Dakota woke, she had to shield her eyes against the light peeking through the scrub. The sun was already high in the sky, and she knew immediately that she'd overslept, her body finally claiming the many hours of sleep it was owed. Last night was the first time she'd slept prone for more than a few hours since leaving the hangar. She yawned and reached for Runyon. He wasn't there. Her heart skipped a beat, and suddenly she was alert. She scrambled out of the ditch to look around the road, but there was no sign of him in either direction. Dakota got a sick feeling in her stomach. It couldn't have been the mech, could it? Why would they have taken him but not her? But what other explanation was there? She wanted desperately to call out for him, but that would be foolish. Dangerous. Where the hell is he? She was just about to go look for him when he appeared on the other side of the road, cresting a ridge. Overwhelmed with relief, she ran to him and flung her arms around him. Whoa, Zack, it's okay. What's wrong? I woke up and you weren't there. Where the hell'd you go? I, uh, <laughs> needed to pee, said Runyon. And it was then that Dakota noticed the look on his face. He was beaming. <laughs> I've never seen someone so happy about taking a piss, she said. He smiled wider. You are not going to believe what I found. He took her hand and tried to lead her back over the ridge, but Dakota jerked him back. He looked at her. What? Just don't do that again. Go off without telling me, okay? He hugged her again. Okay, I'm sorry. Now come and see. He led her to the top of the roadside ridge. And as they came to the top, Dakota stopped abruptly. What lay beyond was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. It was a junkyard, vast and sprawling, occupying most of the shallow valley on the far side of the ridge. Hundreds of rusted, broken down husks of ancient cars and trucks towering stacks of old tires, and beyond that, a mountainous landscape of landfill. Raw material of every type, and more of it than they could ever hope to need. Dakota's mouth hung open in awe. Runyon beamed. If we can get the Liberator here, he said. 
We'll be back in business. She met his grin with one of her own. Then what are we waiting for? Command Unit Report, Unit Rank, War Commander, First Class. Designation, Mech 3948765128743. Filed, 13901541, MKST 2376.235. This unit arrives at Central Plexus. Heavy damage sustained to main plaza and surrounding sub-buildings. Multiple units damaged or destroyed. Surveillance and after-action reports indicate infiltration and assault conducted by escape subjects number 8147676, Bregman, and number 8154729, Runyon. Now in possession of heavy armored weapons platform. Subjects pursued critical damage to weapons platform sustained before lost beneath river units unable to continue pursuit Based on prior resilience, this unit believes high probability subjects Bregman and Runyon remain alive. Request authorization to continue pursuit. Interrogation of Bregman, sibling number 8147675, Samuel Bregman, suggests strong emotional connection. Bregman D, unlikely to abandon, suggests possible next destination. Stand by. Chapter 27 Back at the Liberator, Dakota and Runyon entered the cockpit and took their seats, spurred on by the excitement of their discovery. Runyon fired up the damaged mechanical systems and moved the gundog forward, slowly and carefully. Salvation was within reach, but only if the Liberator's damaged right leg could hold out long enough. Caution was far more important than speed. Thankfully, Runyon had by now become an excellent pilot, and he kept each step steady and sure. And though they moved slowly for the gun dog, it was still faster than Dakota and Runyon had traveled on foot. It wasn't long before they made it to the broken road and the junkyard beyond. Runyon guided them into the midst of the metal skeletons of ancient vehicles and fired up the reclaimer. The giant walker began sucking up everything in range of its magnetic vacuum collecting precious raw materials for reprocessing. Runyon ensured the Liberator's damaged leg was repaired first, so that it could more easily traverse the junkyard. And soon, they were moving smoothly from area to area, exhausting each one of its rusted treasure before plundering the next. Within an hour, the process was complete. The gundog's armor was fully repaired, as were its weapons and internal systems and it had been completely rearmed with newly minted shells. With the Liberator restored to full mobility, Runyon piloted it back to the safety of the forested area they'd come from, so they could take the time to conduct full systems checks without fear of being visually spotted by any passing mech. There, Dakota watched with satisfaction as the cockpit displays produced a series of affirmative reports. Navigation, targeting, comms, guidance, sensor systems, one by one, every system came back to full functionality. Every system but one. Mom? Dakota called out. Her console was telling her that everything was back to 100%, all damage repaired, which only worried her more. Dakota had been holding on to the hope that Rosie would come back once all the Liberator's systems were fixed. But she still wasn't responding. What was there left to try? I'm going back out to the electronics bay to take another look, said Runyon, flipping switches as he climbed out of his seat. I'm coming with you, said Dakota. She knew she should stay in position and monitor the sensors. But the truth was, she was simply too restless with worry to remain in the gunnery chair. There's only room for- Then I'll stand outside and watch, Dakota said firmly. And all Runyon could do was nod. Her tone made it clear that there would be no arguing with her. Moments later, she was standing at the foot of the Liberator while Runyon opened an armored service panel on its rear, just below the cockpit and between its shoulders. As the panel slid aside, it revealed a bay 
lined on all sides by circuit boards and computer innards. The Liberator's brain. And somewhere in there, Rosie's too. She's just sleeping, Dakota told herself. That's all she is, not dead, just asleep. As Runyon crawled inside with a flashlight and a toolkit, all Dakota could do was pick at a ration kit, and that was only to give her hands something to do. It had been a long time since she'd eaten, but she was too anxious to feel hunger. She felt more alone than ever. No Sam. No Falk. And now no Rosie. And it wasn't just her commanding officer's steady competence and reassuring authoritative tone that Dakota felt the absence of. She also simply missed her mother. Though she'd been reduced to a holographic face and a disembodied voice, Rosie was, in every way that mattered to Dakota, still real. Her personality, her memories. Her very soul lived on in silicon, solder, and plastic. Simple materials that now amounted to so much more. Somewhere in there was a real person, resurrected from the dead, long after she had been lost. And now she was lost again. And Dakota's only hope of getting her back was Runyon. She heard movement above her and looked up to see Runyon descending the rungs from the service bay. He was holding something. A black box about the size of one of their ration kits and clutched it tightly, as though afraid of what might happen if he dropped it. What's that? Dakota asked, although she suspected she already knew. Crazy as it might sound. This is Rosie, said Runyon. I mean, it's her memory module, where she's stored. Dakota was afraid of the answer to her next question, and didn't even know exactly how to ask it. Can you... I mean, is she... She's not dead, said Runyon, but she's still an operative. I don't understand it. As far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong with the hardware. It's intact. It's getting power again, but she still won't respond. I've tried everything I can think of. I don't know what else to do, except... He held out the black box, offering it to her. Dakota looked at it hesitantly. Was he offering her all that was left of Rosie? Her lifeless shell of a body? Had he given up? What Runyon said next took her completely by surprise. Talk to her, he said. Dakota looked at him with confusion. What do you mean? Dak, she may not be able to talk to us, but I can't say for sure that she isn't able to hear us, said Runyon. Her input systems are all working, and your earpiece is still connected to her. I, I was thinking, if you talk to her... Maybe you could, I don't know, spark something? Wake her up? If anyone can reach her, it's you. He offered her the box again. This time, gingerly, she reached out and took it, feeling the cold, hard metal in her hands. It was lighter than she'd expected, which only made it seem more fragile. The realization that she was now holding in her hands everything her mother had ever been. Her every thought, feeling, and memory. Both amazed and terrified her. What am I supposed to say? She asked. Runyon shrugged. That I can't tell you. <laughs> I, I know I'm kind of reaching here, but if Rosie really is still in there, then maybe you can trigger some memory. Something that was important to her to get her to... I don't know, it's a long shot, but I, I don't have anything else. How well did... Do you know her? Dakota thought about that. The truth was, she barely knew her mother at all. Only what she had learned in the few weeks since discovering her in the hangar. And most of that time had been spent either training or trying to stay alive. There hadn't been much time for mother-daughter bonding. But still, Runyon was right. There was nothing else left to try. Runyon retired to the pilot's chair in the cockpit above. He said it was to keep an eye on the sensors, but Dakota knew that really it was to give her some privacy. She sat on the ground beneath the Liberator, resting against one of its feet, the memory module in her lap. Even without Runyon watching or listening, 
she felt vaguely ridiculous to be talking to a black metal box. It was a while before she spoke. Hi, Mom, she said finally. It's Dakota. Dak, I don't know if you can hear me, but Runyon says you might still be receiving input from my earpiece mic, and we thought it might help for you to hear my voice, so. If you're alive, awake in there, and you can hear me, um, well, please say something, or give me some kind of a sign. She waited. Runyon had said that if Rosie was able to respond, she could do so through Dakota's earpiece. But no response came. Dakota tried again. I, um, I don't exactly know what to say. Runyon suggested I talk about something meaningful to you, something you'd remember, but I don't know what that is. Because I don't really know you. I never got the chance to know you, or Dad. And now, more than ever, I wish I'd gotten that chance, that we could have been a family. You, me, Dad, and Sam. A light rain had begun to fall, but Dakota barely noticed. Her world had shrunk to the size of only two people, her and Rosie. I wish you'd gotten the chance to know me too, Dakota continued. And Sam, but if you're in there, and you're hearing any of this, maybe it's not too late for that. Not too late for you to find out how both of your kids turned out, because I can still tell you. So, she paused. I guess I'll just start at the beginning. In the hours that followed, Dakota told her mother every story she could remember. Starting with the earliest memory of being on the run from the mech with Sam. And as she spoke, as she rambled on, telling her life story as much to herself as to the box sitting in her lap, she realized there was one constant to all the disjointed anecdotes of her life. Sam. Sam and his bravery. Sam and his selflessness. He had risked his life countless times to protect her. He had made her feel safe, even when everything in the world around her had told her that she was not. And when times were darkest and she was afraid, he had comforted her. She sat bolt upright, remembering. How he comforted me, just as mom once comforted him. And she cleared her throat and sang. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. She paused, hoping for a response, but none came. So she kept singing. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine A crackle sounded in her earpiece A sharp, electronic screech It was followed by a voice Dakota is that you? Can you hear me? Dakota's heart leapt. Mom? It's me. I can't see, but I can hear you. Where am I? Why are you laughing? Dakota was laughing with joy. 
so overwhelmed that she simply couldn't contain it. Forgetting herself momentarily, she shouted up to the cockpit above, Runyon, get down here! Runyon reinstalled the module, and Rosie was back in the cockpit with them, right where she should be. What happened to you? Dakota asked, her eyes still wet with tears. Where did you go? According to diagnostics, my systems went into auto shutdown to protect themselves when the Liberator started losing power, Rosie said. I should have come back with the other systems when you powered her back up. But full recovery from deep shutdown state can be tricky. It's like I was in a coma. What, what's a coma? Runyon asked. It doesn't matter, said Rosie. The point is, you did a hell of a job bringing me back. Thank you, Runyon. I can't take credit, said Runyon. That was all Dak. It was her voice that reached you. I don't think anyone else could have done it. Yes, I remember, said Rosie, her holographic visage turning to Dakota. You sang to me. That was smart of you, stimulating my deep memory core like that. Dakota smiled. Then, just like that, Lieutenant Colonel Rosalind Bregman was back in command. All right, first things first. We need to repair and rearm, she said firmly. How bad is it? Internal sensors must have been hit as they aren't registering any damage at all. Runyon smiled. That's because there is no damage. All systems are fully operational. How is that possible? Rosie asked. We found an old junkyard not far from here, said Dakota. All the raw material we needed to fix us up. Wow, said Rosie. You did a lot while I was out. It was more luck than anything, said Runyon. You make your own luck in this world, Rosie said. You did good, you two. Real good. I'm proud of you both. So now what? Dakota asked. Now? We're fully repaired and rearmed. We have the data we need from Bismarck. And I haven't felt better since I died. So I think it's time this gun dog started living up to its name. Her holographic face smiled. Any preferences for which township we liberate first? Command unit report. Unit rank, war commander, first class. Designation, mech. 3948765128743. Filed, 13911543. MKST 3743.842. This unit requests use of MKACB prototype. Gundog was created and written by Gary Witta and performed by Shannon Woodward. Special appearance by Troy Baker. Music by Austin Wintery. Edited by David Gatewood. Sound editing by Adam Nickerson. Video editing by Chandana Ekanayaka.